My name is Justin Settles. I am the IDRC, the Identification and Recruitment Consortium Project Specialist. Joining me today is Gamaliel Soto from New Mexico. He's a regional recruiter. And today's presentation is entitled Making It Work with Growers and Workers, Building Better Relationships with Agribusinesses. Before we jump in and begin, I would like to encourage everybody um, to download the Whova app if you haven't already downloaded it from your phone. We have 100 and nearly 140 people joining us for this presentation today. We have almost 1,000 people registered for the conference from all over the country. And the Whova app is a great opportunity you know, to participate. There's discussion questions and polls, opportunities to share pictures from the field from where you're working, even though we encourage people not to share photos with students or families. Um, it's a great opportunity to use the app to connect with recruiters from all over the country. Um, so build those bridges with people that you might not have, have met elsewhere. So today's presentation, to be successful, recruiters must learn how to communicate with agribusinesses. During this presentation, we will hear directly from a recruiter who used to work in the field to learn how recruiters can build relationships with agribusinesses, contractors, and workers. We will look at what recruiters can do to catch people's eyes in the field, how not to lose a business's attention, and tips on explaining the importance of education to recruiters to workers that they meet. This presentation is gonna be a little bit different than some presentations that you've seen and that we're gonna be conducting it interview style. And so I will be asking Gamalil, Gama, the questions and he will be responding based on his experiences and his history working in the field, getting a degree and, and then moving on to become a recruiter. Gama, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Buenos dias a todos. Hi, everyone. My name is Gamaliel Soto. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you just great. Okay. You can call me Gama. Okay. I am from Los Angeles, Durango, Mexico, a very small town. I was born there. Um, it's a very small town. We were very poor, but it was actually very good because I had the opportunity to enjoy the little moments with my loved ones. Uh, I used to work picking cotton and harvesting um, beans with my grandparents. I will help them actually. I was living with my mother and my brothers and my father will be working on the United States in, the, in our culture. So he will go and visit us every two or three months. When I was 11 years old, he decided to bring us to the United States. Uh, I enrolled into middle school I started working on the American fields when I was 11 years old. I have worked in different jobs uh, since topping onions, uh, picking chili, cleaning onions, desaijando, irrigation, feeding cattle, uh, limpiando nuez, lettuce in la lechuga, in el melón, in la sandía, and a lot of different jobs in our culture. I have faced many challenges and dangers as other farm workers do, actually. Um, two, four months ago, I was still working on the fields, actually. When I was 15 years old, um, I'm going to share this with you. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was working on the onion processor. And I remember that it was a very beautiful day. Until my right hand got stuck in the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt, it's a machine that we were using to carry and to carry the onion sacks, the onion bags. So it has a lot of rollers and the rollers are very close to each other in order for the machine to move. So my hand got stuck in between three of the rollers. I had to wait there like for two or three hours. Some of the workers actually had to break the machine apart. They took me to the hospital. I stood at the hospital for around a month or more. Uh, the doctors wanted to cut off my hand. They told me that uh, I was not gonna be able to, to keep my hand anymore, you know, like, because the accident was uh, very uh, bad. Um, something happened, I don't know what happened, but they decided not to at the end. Uh, I'm glad they didn't. I still have my right hand. I never gained my entire mobility again. 
I had to adapt to the new situations, like everything in life. I learned how to grab a pencil in a better way. I graduated. I continued working on the on the farms, and I graduated in, in May 2020 with a bachelor with a bachelor's in social work. I really like uh, helping people, and uh, now I am working as a full time recruiter with the MEP program, and I am I feel very very blessed for this uh people i don't i don't have that privilege to to know a lot of you guys uh but it's awesome to have you here on this presentation and if i can share something with you very fast i don't know what kind of problems you're having in your life or what kind of problems are you having in your day but um please don't ever give up continue doing what you're doing you're awesome everything's gonna be okay and Thank you for this opportunity. And I really hope that uh, the information that we're gonna provide to you can help you in your um, recruitment process or the things you do when working with families. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Gama. We're, we're the ones that are blessed to be able to have this opportunity to hear and learn from you. Thank you for sharing your story and your knowledge with all of us. Um, you know, as we begin, everybody, I will be paying attention to the chat, to the Q&A box. So if you ever have any questions, um, you can write them down, let us know, and we'll try to address them. So to begin with, Gamma, I would like, just like to ask you, what is it like to be a farm worker with children? It is actually, Justin, um, it is a challenge. It always is. Uh, they don't pay very good in the fields when it's for hours and when you are working for like by contract, you know, by the paying rate, uh, they will pay you for what you accomplish. Uh, you really have to push your body to the limits. My kids, in my case, I have four daughters. Um, my kids were somehow my motivation directly and indirectly. Um, as I stated before, you must push yourself so they can have, they can have food on their table so they can have clothes and uh, shoes, you know, or a toy during Christmas. Family uh, is the strength that keeps you going in the fields. Just imagine waking up at two or three in the morning and you don't feel like going to work because your hands are sore, your back hurts, or you have pain in your knees and you just don't have the strength to continue working. You, you are so tired. But then you go, you walk to, you, to your room and to the your kids room and you find them they're sleeping very peaceful and calm so you find the strength you needed to go to work there and then you go to work and around two or three in the afternoon you feel like giving up you can't continue your body is actually telling you hey gamma i can't continue you are gonna pass out you you can't keep doing this but your mind and your heart keeps telling you hey you're gonna be able to buy a toy for your children everything is going to be okay you have a lot of bills to pay you need to continue working so uh my kids were my strength my kids were were the ones providing providing me that that strength to continue towards the day i was going to school for my major as a social worker and i was also a farm worker so uh, i will have to work from four in the morning to ten or 11 in the afternoon in order for me to have enough money or I will work one day to get the money that you can get in today. So the next day I will go to school and then the next day I will go to work the entire day and the next day I will go to school again. And uh, I was working on the fields, but because the contractors were very flexible. You see, there's a lot of people and families that experience these kind of situations like me. Uh, there's a lot of people that they don't work in the fields because they want to. They work in the fields, they work in the fields because they don't have documents. They don't have other choice. Some of them, they don't speak English. They don't have a major, they don't have an education. And the only place in which they can work is the fields. And that's our true and our reality. How can recruiters catch a worker's eye in the field? Well, just keep in mind that most of the times we're gonna be very focused on our jobs. 
we don't want the contractors to get mad with us because we're doing something wrong. So recruiters just keep in mind that when approaching to people, uh, just have different ways of approaching. Uh, try to help them if it's permitted, depending on the job. If not, you can just stay uh, there, like walking with them, you know, while they work without uh, interrupting them from their work, just ask questions. And it's, it is important for you to be very outgoing and willing to interact in different ways with these people. Try and find ways of, of approaching to them. Something that really helps, it's having something in your hands. Like I, I was at a, when, when I go to the fields, I, have, I like having a backpack and I put some bandanas, some gloves and some English learning books. So I will provide these items to two or three of the workers and that interactions becomes natural. So other, other, the other workers would like to, to talk to me right away. Sometimes, uh, personally, most times actually, I ask the contractors before visiting the fields, hey, how many workers uh, do you have right now? And they will tell me like 25 or 30. And I will go to the store and get a good deal in Sam's, buy some Cokes, some Gatorades. And I put those uh, refills on my cooler. And then I will take the cooler to the fields. I'll put it on the floor so that the workers can get some drinks. And this has helped me a lot to create good relationships. At the end of the day, workers are always saying, hey, come back, please bring us some more Gatorades. And you know, it's, it's a way of interacting with families and creating that relationships. I really suggest for recruiters to be very good at ice breaking. Rompiendo el hielo, como decimos en español. What, what would make you stop when you were working in the fields paying attention to a recruiter? Well, this actually happened to me once or two. Uh, we were working at the fields and some people from other programs will go and visit the fields uh, driving these very nice cars. And imagine it was raining sometimes and the roads were slippery and those little cars will, those little cars will not, uh, weren't able to, to make it to, to the field actually. So they will get stuck and stuff like that. Some people were dressed too, too nice for the situation. I remember this day there was this woman uh, wearing heels and she was trying to walk toward the uh, rows of dirt and it was very difficult for her to, we started laughing about her. Recruiters, we don't want to, to create that impression on the fields. Try to dress adequately for the situation. Also, I think in my opinion, from my perspective, we have a hard time uh, trusting people that don't speak our language. Uh, so it's really important for us to be able to communicate with the farmers. So if they don't speak uh, Spanish, it's gonna be very difficult. Now, please uh, don't take me wrong here. I'm not saying that if you don't speak Spanish, you can't be a recruiter. Uh, of course you can. Just um, my advice is to get familiar with the concept, with the traditions, with the culture, so you can find different ways of interacting and connecting with these families. Um, don't let the workers be aware that you're nervous. Uh, don't look scared when you're speaking to the workers. We need to be firmly and confident about what we are stating or saying. Uh, make sure that, that you know your program good, the MEP program in this situation. Make sure that you know what your services can do for families. Make sure that you are familiar with the concept of oppression, discrimination, and other problems caused by immigration and uh, things like that. We have one question in the chat, Gama. Yes, of course. Um, how do you approach a farmer or grower who does not want you there during work hours? Try, I would try to, the owner, are we talking about the owner of the fields? Yeah, so if you, you know, you were trying to go out to meet with farm workers, how do you approach a farm owner or grower or contractor who does not want you there during their work hour? 
sometimes we gotta find that the time we wanna work on our schedule. Like it's not about our time, but about the time of the workers. If if they don't feel like we we should go to visit their field when they're working, we can find another time. I think that sometimes it is necessary just to to ask the farmer, hey, can I visit their house? Uh, let's say if they live in a ranch or at their place. So you really need to ask for, for permission to go and visit them after the hours of work. If not, you can just go ahead and tell the, the farmer, hey, can I go after you finish the day of work so I can talk to them very fast? And as I stated before, uh, just have something, uh, something that really helps is telling them, hey, I have some Gatorades for them. They can really have some um, refill, get some a little break when they're done, you know, they're tired. And then I'm just going to provide some research to them. And I'm not going to take a long time, a lot of time talking to them. It'll be fast. So, yeah, that's my recommendation on that. Thank you. How should recruiters communicate with workers? Uh, just be positive all the time. All the time, be positive. Um, we remember to be professional and respectful to, to the people with me, to the families. Be aware of your body expressions, recruiters. Be aware of the words you use. Uh, respect others' perspectives. Uh, engage quickly, create he healthy relationships. And don't forget that you are there to recruit people and we're trying to provide services for students so students can get an education. So you don't wanna stay talking to families for two hours. You wanna be efficient and fast and, and you wanna find different ways of connecting with people while at the same time you are being able to obtain your goal. Sometimes workers will try to discourage you, but you need to be mentally prepared to, to have conversations with them and without you losing your focus on your goals. We need to talk with authority while remaining humble. You know, I, I stated before, um, know your services, know their needs, tell them, try to teach them in a humble way that uh, uh, it is important for people to receive the services, how the services are going to benefit them, why are we doing and why are we doing uh, these for the students, why is it important? Now, be strategic, but in order for, be, for us to be strategic, when talking to people, we really need to, to work after hours. What I'm saying here is just do some research. Learning is a continuous process, so prepare yourself. Learn some tips on how to have better conversation. Auto regulation, get familiar with the different concepts and with the needs of the families. Just learn so you can have arguments. And so when we're speaking with farm workers, we're not speaking based on our ideology, but with arguments and something that we can prove. Are there any specific services that you have found that you can bring up that really um, get people excited to talk to you? Especially yeah. with related to OSY or out of school youth. Well, I like, I don't really have something like, like services, but I like to motivate them. And this is some, somehow this is a service that you can provide as an individual. Uh, share your experience with them, uh, provide them uh, resources about uh, colleges, different opportunities they have, different majors they can choose because sometimes always white students, they're not wanting to continue with education anymore, right? And it is very efficient when we help them learn about the opportunities that are there for them. So just what I've been providing them lately, let's say they're working, right? So I will provide gloves, I will provide masks. If they don't speak English, I will provide them some English learning books, but also letting them know that they can really go and look for a, an, a, an education and the different options they have, they will, just will create in them a better perspective of what they can do and what they can't do. 
Thank you. Before we continue, we do have one question in the Q&A box, but for some reason, Zoom is not allowing me to open that up. So as we continue, if you do have questions, feel free to type them into chat and I will let Gamma know. So Gamma, one of the things I'm interested in, well, what are the types of people that you have found that you often encounter in the field? Well, I have divided uh, the fields into four groups. So the first group, I, I like to call them distributors, distribuidores, right? This group are those that don't qualify. They are just listening to you respectfully, right? And, but it's good to talk to them. It's good to introduce the program to them because even though they don't qualify, uh, even though they say, hey, but I, I've been living here for 10 years and I don't even have children anymore. They might know someone that might qualify. So still provide a brochure to them, provide your business card, explain the problem to them, the program to them, because they indirectly are promoting the program for you. And they might know someone that will qualify. Now, the other group, I call them neutrals. And this group are those that are listening to you, but they, they don't really care about what you're saying. They just continue working and doing the job. So you can just go ahead and continue walking towards the field and to other individuals because they don't care. So it's okay. It happens sometimes, you know, and there's going to be a lot of people like this. So move forward to someone that really wants to, to hear from you. Now, there's another group and I call this group distractors and I laugh about it because it's very common to find this kind of people in the field. I've been interacting with them a lot as a farm worker, actually, and I know where, what they are capable of. Look, distractors are those that will try to discourage you using bad words, asking you questions unrelated with your job, or trying to make you feel bad. You can fight them. Some of them will be drinking, and it sounds, it's going to sound weird, but this is actually happening on the field. Now, they're going to be drinking at 8, 8.30 in the morning or they're going to be using drugs because that's very common on the fields. Um, they're going to be under the effects of these substances and they're going to try to make you feel bad. My recommendation is do not engage with this population too much time. There's nothing for you to do talking with them because there's, they're not ready for this conversation, not just yet. Okay, so they shouldn't represent a problem if a recruiter is prepared for this. So something that had happened to me in the past, I've been there um, recruiting people and there was this guy telling me, ¿Cómo se mira usted con un asadón? How will you look with this um, 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 tool in your hand? Trabajando aquí en el campo. ¿Qué tal se le hace el trabajo? Uh, what do you think about your job? But in, like in a bad way. And I, I would tell them, I would tell them, you know what? I've been working on the fields my entire life. And actually the contractor, which I'm working for, I used to work with him when I was a kid. And he was, oh, really? And how did you do it to get out from the farm? And I was like, well, I had to do something for my people. Nobody was doing nothing. So I had to look for, for help for, because we need help. Somebody needs to, to speak for us. Están haciendo con nosotros lo que quieren y nadie nos ayuda. Nos están olvidando. So there was another guy um, I, I approached to him. And he told me, no, a mí no me traiga servicios, a mí no me traiga mochilas, a mí tráigame unas cervezas y a mí tráigame unas quién sabe qué y para acá. And he was just being very mean. So I, I laughed a little bit and I told him, hey, okay, I'll be back, okay? Let me just go and talk to this family and I'll, I'll be back with you, okay? Have a good day. And he didn't want me to go, but I had to. So just like we like to say in Spanish, Algunas veces necesitamos un poquito de, de barrio y saber interactuar con la gente. Sometimes we need to be um, strategic on this, these little details. These people really know how to get into your nerves and they will ruin your entire day if you let them. And what is worse, they, they can really uh, make you seem bad in front of other workers and you don't want that. Now, the fourth and last population are those that qualify. 
to find this population, we must learn to mute the other three populations. And we need to try to identify the ones that qualify. Something, can we, yeah. Uh, sometimes we will see these workers falling back in, in, the, in the fields, uh, slow, slowing the, the pace or speeding up because they want to separate from the other workers. So be attentive. Be attentive to your environment and to what is happening. More, in most of the case, this means that they want to talk to you or they want to hear more about your program. So go talk to them, approach to them, say, ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? ¿Qué tal tu día? Uh, are you interested in learning more about our program? And sometimes they will cooperate with you right away. Sometimes you are going to be able to provide services for visa families or to fill out the, the COE, I mean, and recruit them because they're going to be willing to, to be interviewed by you. A lot of times they won't be a, uh, wanting to share information with you. But why? Why were they wanting to separate from the crew or from the other workers? Well, the answer is because some workers are receiving SNAP benefits. Some other workers are receiving employing, employing, employment benefits, even though they're still working on the fields. Other workers are in the process of uh, getting the residence. And other workers are undocumented workers and then they don't want to be exposed because they're afraid that when they provide information to you, this information uh, is going to be seen by the government or other people. So it is important for us to be clear on what our program is and what is the goal of it. Just let them know that you are not, gonna, no, you are not there to, to affect them, but you are there to help them and provide services for them if they qualify. So explain this to people because people really misunderstand our programs and a lot of times they don't like sharing stories with you. So sometimes it's gonna be easy to recruit people. Sometimes it's not gonna be that easy. And two weeks ago, no, three weeks ago, I, had, uh, I met this person. Uh, she's a community member. Her name is Lupe just to give her a name. This, this is not her real name, right? But uh, let's say her name is Lupe. She's an active member of the community. She just likes and loves helping people, migrant people. So I got in touch with her and she told me about this family in, uh, this family was, is from Guatemala. It's a single mother. She has two, ki two kids. And she recently came to, to this country. Now she told me, can you call her? Because I think that she qualifies for your program. And I called this family. She gave me the, the number of this family. And when I called her, this young lady answered the phone and she was like, who are these? Who are you? How do you know our names? Where are you calling from? And they really didn't want it to share information with me. Mom didn't want it to talk to me, actually, the first time. So what I did is that I told them, look, I, I work for a program that provides services for uh, families, migrant families that move from one place to another. And I explained the program to them, right? So I told them, I need to know if you qualify in order for you to receive services. But in order for, for us to know if you qualify, I need to interview you and it's gonna only gonna take like five minutes so mom didn't want it to uh she wasn't willing to share information at all with me any kind of information so i told her you know what let's do something i'm gonna leave you a brochure with lupe because this mom let's say her name was maria uh because maria really trusted lupe but she didn't trust me so I told her, I'm going to leave a brochure with Lupe so you can learn more about your program. And I will call you next week. And if you think that we can help you, we'll do that interview. And she was, okay. So next week, I got some food boxes from uh, this association. So I saved two food boxes for this family. And I called her and I told her, hey, I'm going to leave you two food boxes for you with Lupe. Okay. 
have you read the brochure? And she said, yes. And are you ready to do the interview? Uh, no, not yet. So another week passed. So the next week I called her and I told her, hey, Maria, it's me again, Gamma. How are you doing? How's your day going? How was work? You know, I have recently received some backpacks. I have some school supplies and we're planning on doing some summer classes for the students. You know, I really would like to help you, but I can't if you don't qualify for a program. In order for us to, to, to know if you qualify, I need to interview you. Are you willing to do that interview? And she agreed. I interviewed her. She's now part of our program, but it took me three weeks and different strategies in order for me to recruit this family. So just be aware that sometimes it's gonna be hard to recruit families. Just don't give up, keep trying. It's worth it. Gamma, we had one question in the chat. Do you have any strategies in particular that you use in order to mute the other three populations while out recruiting in order to find those eligible families? Yes, of course. Uh, technique. <laughs> technique. You develop that uh, with time. Just don't... We're going to talk about this later on on the presentation. I'm going to provide you more information about it. Um, but uh, don't take things personal. You are a professional. Remember to separate your personal values, your personal beliefs from your work ethics. And that'll help you a lot. But I'll, I'll explain you later on uh, and for it on this presentation. Awesome. How can recruiters improve their relationships with farm workers? Well, I keep saying be positive. You know, find ways of connecting with people. Learn about their culture or like music or whatever, or be familiar with the problems they experience every day. So you have talk, something to talk to them about. Uh, appreciate the work they do. Let them know. Really, these little details, details are the ones that make the difference when we're recruiting. Just let them know, señores, qué bueno que están trabajando. Me da mucho gusto lo que hacen. No saben cuánto significan para nosotros y para esta comunidad. Qué duro trabajan y qué bonito, qué orgullosos es, es estar de lo que hacen. Let them know that you're proud of them. Let them know that the, the, the job they do is it's awesome. And uh, just acknowledge that what they're doing. Don't lose focus on what they're doing, what you're doing. Okay, don't as as I have to say it again. Don't don't talk too much with the families. Don't stay like two hours or an hour talking to them. Be fast, be fast, and be efficient. Uh, do your job. Um, create a good interaction. Create that connection, and eventually, if you recruit a family, you are gonna be able to create a good rapport with families. Visit the workers, farm owners, even during the off season. I would say call them. Call them. This this is easy to do. It only it's only gonna take like two three minutes, depending. Ask the families. Hey, have you received the services? Have you received the backpacks? Have you received the the school supplies? Um, do you need anything? Are your kids doing okay in school? Just create that rapport with with families once they are already in the program. Don't take things personal in the field again. Uh, learn to separate. Look, everyone, we are full of bias, right? We need to understand we have, we have bias. We have different perspectives. We have a different ideology. We have different beliefs, values, and moral uh, beliefs as well. We need to separate that from our ethical behavior. We're there to recruit people. We're there to help students who graduate and continue with their education right? So don't lose focus, okay? You are there because you are a professional. Remember something, remember something. When you're walking towards the fields, you are no longer the recruiter. It doesn't matter if you have a badge on you or you have a degree or if you have a desk at your house or you have a place at your office. You are nobody. You are the person, you are a distraction to them, actually. You are the person wasting their time. But it's up to you to change this perspective and become el joven del programa MP que nos ayudó, right? They're already in their environment. We're strangers there. 
Um, I would follow up on your promises with farm workers and their families. Remember recruiters, we are the image of the program. Let's change to the other slide, uh, Justin, and I'll explain that in the, in the other, yeah. So how can recruiters improve their relationship with farm owners and contractors? Just little details, call them. It's only gonna take like five minutes five, five minutes or six or seven, it doesn't matter. If uh, uh, the employees are busy, call them another day. And they're still busy, just keep trying. Just don't make them mad, okay? Uh, try not to. Some will get mad, that's natural, but it's okay. But uh, we still have the opportunity to, to create good relationships with a lot of contractors and employers. Introduce a program to them. Let them, do, let them know that what they're doing is awesome, providing employment to a lot of workers that working in the fields, it's something very, very good and admirable. Let them know, let them know that they could be the only bridge between our services and the families needing help. Now, I really recommend for you to have a strategy on finding the way of sharing with them. Just wait for the right moment and share with them the responsibility of our children and the, the, the responsibility that we have to, to let people learn about education. We need to, when we leave the fields, uh, workers will start, farm workers will start to reflect on, on these little details because they don't get to think a lot of this. They're always busy. Be polite, be respectful, respect their position. They're the leaders there. You're just a stranger. Again, be thankful. When you arrive to the field, and you're talking uh, and you already have permission to to talk to the workers talk to them again talk to them again for a little bit and tell them hey okay i'm gonna go ahead and proceed to talk to the worker thank you so much for the opportunity uh when you are leaving the the, the fields talk to them again and make sure that they're aware that they what they have done giving you permission to talk to the workers what's something good for the families now follow up Follow up, uh, we were talking about this before on the other slide, follow up with families who are the image of the program. Listen, if you don't, as a recruiter, if you don't follow up with your families, your recruiter, those families are gonna start talking bad about our program. Those families are gonna start talking bad about you. And wherever you go in that community, you are gonna have a lot of trouble, uh, problems recruiting people. But if you follow up with your services and with your, on your promises, the same thing's gonna happen. They're gonna start talking about you and about your program. Maybe they won't remember your name and it's okay because it doesn't matter as long as you, you are being able to help somebody. But they're gonna start talking good things about the program. Now, who do you think they're gonna tell first? The contractor, the farmer. Hey, this guy that came the other day is really helping me. So that contractor is gonna open the doors for you next season. But if you don't follow up, those doors are not gonna open again. So that's what is very important. I like to say that we recruiters are the image of the program because uh, we represent our leaders as well, supervisors, mentors, and we represent a, a, a program. So be ethical, be professional. You are not a recruiter just between eight and five in the afternoon. No, you are a recruiter all the, all the day. So be careful with your testimony and what you do outside because people look forward to you. You are a leader in this community. You are helping families. So really think about that, reflect about that and prepare yourself. What is your advice on how to de-escalate a tense situation in the field? Well, auto regulation. And this is something I learned lately, lately, like not a long time ago, Justin, like I will say, two years ago. Uh, look, I wanna share something with you guys. I'm a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I've been training MMA since I was 18 years old. Now, I, I really like to think that I know how to defend myself against people, but it's worthless. It's worthless if you don't know how to, how to regulate your emotions, right? Remember this, when we're working on the fields, we are under stress. We're exposed to the sun. The, hard, the work we're doing is very difficult. We're tired. We want to go home. We 
we we have a lot of bills to pay. We have economical instability. We have a lot of problems. So just we're having conflicts with other co-workers. We're always thinking uh, and having discussions with the contractors because los contratos los contratistas nos dicen échele más botes a la caja de cebolla corten bien la hierba y esto y lo otro so just keep that in mind that uh, workers might be stressed when you approach them now strong emotions can affect or interfere with our professional job who am I talking about here de los trabajadores del campo um, am I talking about the workers or about uh, about our emotions I'm talking about our emotions our body expressions how we interact with people. If we let things get personal, we're gonna lose. Don't forget that you are a professional. Don't forget that you are supposed to be the educated person. So out of regulation, out of regulate your emotions is crucial. Now it doesn't say important or necessary, it says crucial, very close to essential. So learn to, to breathe, you know, go to the next slide, Justin, please just learn how to how to breathe learn listen to the to the worker listen to them don't raise your voice don't raise your voice and of course please learn when to let go it is okay to let go sometimes go to your house think about what just happened evaluate analyze what happened Try to find different approaches, different strategies in order for you to go back and talk to this family. Now, ask yourself, is it worth it for me to go and talk to this family? And if you think and you have decided that it's worth it, then ask, your help. ask, ask, ask yourself, is it healthy? Can I do it? If you can't do it and you really think that this, this family still need help, go and talk to your supervisor and tell her or tell him, hey, you know what? I don't feel like it's a good idea for me to go and talk to this family, but they need help and they're the priority. Can we find another recruiter so go and finish the job? So just find different ways. Awesome. Before moving forward, we had a couple questions in chat um, going back to conversing with farm workers and ag business owners. Do you have any um, good opening lines, opening conversation starters on how to approach um, farm workers and business owners? Yes, but I'm going to have to say it in Spanish and then I'll translate it to English. <laughs> I just like to, to go there and being very active, being very enthusiastic when, when you talk, just be like, hey, eh, ¿cómo andamos hoy? ¿Qué tal la chamba? ¿Cómo nos anda tratando el contratista? How is the contractor treating us today? Be, I like to joke a little bit, but know your limits, okay? Este, qué, qué bonito el día, ¿no? Tenemos otro día más para vivir. Nos los han regalado, démosle gracias a Dios. Este, eh, está dura la chamba, pero muchos ya no tienen esa oportunidad. The, the job is very hard, but a lot of people have died yesterday. A lot of people died yesterday, they don't have this opportunity anymore. So just find ways of motivate people, even though they're doing a very hard job, there's a lot of uh, different, um, how do you say it? Uh, phrases that we can use to motivate them. Make, them. make them feel proud about this. Just be open and, and outgoing. Listen to them. Uh, they will answer you, no, pues aquí nos traen trabajando. Ya se la sabe, ¿qué hacemos? Un día más, un día menos, ¿no? Pues yeah, of course, un día más, un día menos, pero ¿qué le hacemos? Hay que seguir chambeando y si podemos, porque de que se puede, se puede. Now, I, I, I like to use, I, I like to talk firmly, confident on what I'm saying and look at their eyes. Always look at their eyes because uh, that's important. That's important. Look at their eyes, talk to them. And, and, and yeah, please let me know if I'm not being specific on my answers so I can uh, redirect those answers in a, in a different way. We'll let you know. So Thank now you. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how your social work degree has impacted your recruiting and how the knowledge you've gained from your social work degree has helped you become a better recruiter. So can you explain to us a little more about cultural competency and how important it is for recruiting? Cultural competency, yeah. 
by definition, cultural competency is the ability for you to interact with other cultures or populations, right? By being empathetic, by being respectful, by understanding the way other cultures think. You see, we are working with different cultures. We are working with people that have different perspectives than us. And we need to be prepared to engage with these different cultures. We need to learn why they're thinking what they're thinking, right? So yeah, cultural competence is, is critical, Justin. Recruiters to learn and study other cultures, understand others' ideas and points of view. Uh, we need to be empathetic, not sympathetic. I'm saying empathetic. Now, you don't necessarily need to uh, have experience on the farm to be empathetic. You can create that with, with time. Really care about people. Uh, try to put yourself in their situations. Understand what's happening to them from their perspective. Let's say if you're trying to, to tell them something about the importance of education, uh, try to, to put yourself in the situation. Try to think that you have a lot of bills to pay. You don't have enough money. You don't have a car. You don't have documents. How can you go to school? Now, when you're trying to give them an advice, try to provide that advice based on their perspective. Why do you feel that some families struggle to place an importance on education? Well, it would see at the right, uh, we have a picture about the pyramid of needs, Maslow's uh, theory. It's not actually a theory, it's more like an approach. I'm not gonna talk a lot about like that pyramid, right? Uh, I don't wanna focus on that, but I really like the representation about it on my personal life and the life of farm workers. If you read the, the bullet points, we have that families have different needs. Many families can only place an importance on education after their other needs have been met. If your basic needs are not met, you cannot proceed to, to focus on other situations or not, on other goals. We work with students, but we forget about working with parents. We're not born with knowledge and we learn by seeing others. Now, let me, let me tell you a story very fast. My brother was going to high school. We have been working on the fields uh, our entire lives, right? So my brother was in high school and he, he, he told us, hey, I'm, I'm gonna withdraw from high school. But why are, we, why are you gonna withdraw from high school? Why don't you wanna go to, to school anymore? And he, he told me, you know what, Kama? I have opening, I have, on it, I have opened it, the fridge so many times and there's not enough food in the fridge. Um, my dad doesn't have a lot of money. The, an education is not realistic for me. That triggered memories in me about when I was a child and I will see my dad sitting on, the, on his bed, pulling his hairs and crying. And I will ask myself, why is he crying? Why is my dad crying? Why is he doing that? Uh, he was so worried about paying bills about us having a house, about us having enough food on our table that he barely had time to talk about education with us. How can you focus on education when you're not meeting your basic needs? You see, when we work and provide services for students, when a system provides uh, support for students, you are helping them during that uh, specific time. But those students are gonna go back to their houses now, according to the social learning theory of Albert Bandura, we learn through experience. We learn like by seeing other actions, then we repeat those actions, we retain, we, we repeat, and then we evaluate and we continue doing that, right? Parents don't think that education is important. Sometimes it's not that they don't wanna think that education is important. Sometimes they just don't have time. So we need to go back and start working with those families from home so they can start educating their kids. Educating by saying this, motivating them. Los papás tienen que empezar a decirles a los niños, hijo, tú puedes. Hijo, estoy trabajando en el campo y esto es bien difícil, pero tú puedes alcanzar tus sueños. You can reach your goals and your dreams if you want to. Una palabra puede hacer la diferencia. Only one word can make a difference. That's the only thing somebody, uh, the people need sometimes. 
in my case, that's the only thing I needed. I only needed for someone to tell me, hey, you can do it. That person stood at the door. He got out from, from job, from his job. Uh, he was topping onions that day. And he got, uh, he stood at the door. He was dirty, todo mojado, empapado de lodo. And he looked at me and he told me, you know what, Gama? You can, you can do it. You are going to go to school because you, you can do it. It is okay to go to school. I'm going to help you. I'll support you. I believe in you. And you're going to prove yourself and we're going to prove everybody that you can accomplish your goals. And, and I did it. That, that person was my dad. That person was my dad. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what, who talked to him because during a long time, he never had any interest in me going to school. He actually told me, you are not going to be able to go to college because I don't have money and that's expensive. We don't have a car. I was 18 years old and I didn't even have a phone. How, how was I supposed to go to school and pay uh, uh, tuition? It is, it is difficult for this family. So we need to start working with parents from, how, from the house so, so we can start educating them about, about the importance of education. Like we said in the fields, cuando andamos limpiando, when we're cleaning the weeds, corte la hierba desde la raíz. Go for the root, porque si no la corta desde la raíz, va a volver a crecer. La raíz son los padres. The root are the parents. Gama, how do you communicate with families from Mexico or Guatemala who have different languages other than English and Spanish um, to talk to them about education or convince you know, them to participate in the program? Like if they don't speak Spanish or English? Yes. Well, that never happened to me before, actually. Most people that I know from Guatemala, they do speak Spanish. And they do have different uh, ways of calling uh, the things, uh, but uh, uh, the words, you know, but most of them that speak Spanish. I interacted with a lot of uh, people from Brazil when I was doing volunteering work in Las Cruces in this church. We were helping immigrants and we had to find an interpreter. So communication, if our program starts to have families that don't speak Spanish or English, well, we need to find uh, a way of having someone to speak their language and try to, to work with them. We're not gonna give up because they don't speak our, our language. We're gonna find someone that can help them. If we can help them, we're gonna refer them because that's what recruiters do actually as well. We need to start referring people to other agencies. We can provide services, but other, other agencies are gonna be able to help them. Thank you so much. In, at the end of this presentation, I will share uh, my contact information. And if anybody is looking for resources in a specific language or dialect um, that they might be struggling to be able to communicate with, I know especially around the country, we're seeing migrant populations become much more diverse, which is a great thing to see. We're seeing a lot more families coming from um, East Asian backgrounds, as well as families coming in from lots of different countries in Africa, speaking Swahili, Burundi, um, as well as dialects from and languages from Central America. And if anybody is struggling with a particular language that they would really like to be able to learn a little bit more and communicate more with families in their area, feel free. Um, they can send me an email and I can help them get connected with other recruiters or other states that are working with similar populations that might have some resources. So Gama, how can recruiters help explain the importance of education to families and farm owners as well while they're out there working? Well, first of all, ask them that for their permission for you to share your opinion or your story. That way they know that you're respecting their perspective and point of view. In my case, I use my personal testimony. You know, uh, I like to tell them about the benefits of getting an education. I mean, just be clear about that. Like you can get more money if you get an education, you're gonna be able to help your parents. And we uh, Mexican people, uh, in my opinion, we like helping our parents a lot. That's one of our dreams for most of people. We wanna be able to buy a house for our mother uh, or buy a car for our dad or helping uh, with his bills. 
So I like to, to tell them, hey, you know what? I understand you. I, I came here when I was 11 years old. I still struggle with, with my English. I have an accent. I, I know what is to be discriminated by, uh, because we have a brown skin color. I know what is to have a language barrier. I know how hard and difficult it is to understand math when you don't speak English. It's like you're trying to understand two totally different languages. And I let them know, you know what, but uh, I never stopped believing in me. Even though when it seemed that everybody was not believing in me anymore, I, I, I continued doing what I, what I, what I wanted to, uh, to do. I, I kept fighting and I never gave up because everything's possible, you really want to, to get it. And I like to help them imagine the world that they don't believe in anymore because they don't, uh, they have never been exposed. They have never been exposed to education and just let them know, hey, imagine if you, you get out your major, imagine if you go to, you, to college or you continue going to high school, you are gonna be able to do a lot of things because you are gonna want to continue working here in the fields for a long time. And eventually when you are 40, 45 years old, your body is gonna start to react because you have been working on the agriculture and you are not gonna be able to, to, to have a, a natural life. I'm talking about most people that works on the farms, uh, they experiment, experience arthritis, uh, pain in the back, shoulders pain and different things, you know? And, um, I let them know that. Won't you like to work in an office? Won't you like to work like uh, drive a nice car? And I connect like nice things to the importance of education. I, I like to tell them about like uh, the money they, they're gonna be able to do. And, but it takes, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of dedication, but it's possible. And I let them know, you know, I believe in you. I believe in you and I think you can do it because I was able to do it. And I see a lot of potential in you. Just that about you wanting to, to do it. How has your perspective changed now that you are a recruiter? Uh, somehow I'm, I am familiar with the needs of our farm workers and uh, uh, with the needs of migrant families based on my own experience, you know. Uh, Isaac Newton once said, veo lo que puedo ver porque estoy sentado sobre los hombros de gigantes. I am being able to see further because I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. So we need to learn from our supervisors and our mentors and other recruiters that have been working for a long time in this program. Uh, it's okay to learn from there. Uh, that way we don't have to experience the entire process again. Use that knowledge and prepare ourselves better. I think that we should be asking the families about their needs because that way we can have an idea about the needs and the interventions we provide and how can get better our interventions. How has education changed your perspective on life? Ooh. How much time do we still have, uh, Justin? We have uh, 15 minutes left. Okay. Education, well, uh, let's say it this way. I was raised with a concept that men don't cry, that women are weak, that men are the ones supposed to be working, that women should stay in their houses, um, ironing, cooking, taking care of the children. I was raised with the concept of that uh, brown skinned Mexicans uh, were born to be poor and that white men, they will have money and they will go to school and that school was for nurses. And we rarely touch the topic about college or education in the house. But education, Justin, education has taught me that it is okay to cry, that not expressing our feelings could be bad to our mental and physical health, that women are not weak, 
they are as strong as men in their own way and that each one is a complement for each other. Education has taught me that it does not matter what your skin color is. Under the constitution, we're still the same and we deserve the same opportunities. Education has taught me that school is for everyone and that it's very important and essential, essential to educate our families about this importance. What do you feel are some of your biggest challenges now that you are a recruiter? Well, I would say my biggest challenge is this that I sometimes I, I still ask myself it what I'm doing it's enough. I wish I could do a lot more for these families. Sometimes I, I, I want just to to have more funds and find better uh, ways of providing support to these families, to the students. I wish I could like meet more people with our same goals and being able to provide services for these families. But uh, I really think that MEP program is, is a very good program. And I'm sure that if we still continue working on collaboration, we're gonna be able to accomplish great things for this family system. And then how has your social work degree helped make you a better recruiter? First of all, I don't see social work as a degree or a profession or as a career or major. I don't see social work as a particular job, in fact. I think social services should be something that every individual in our community should be implementing. We should be always trying to help others. Um, by definition, the social work profession with social workers, we're trying to meet the basic needs of families or uh, complex needs. You know, we focus in minority groups, uh, experiencing oppression, poverty, um, uh, other problems, inter intersectionality problems, you know, like uh, let's say being poor, being undocumented, being a, a brown skinned woman and stuff like that. So don't take me wrong here. We, the MEP program, we're doing something very similar, aren't we? I think we are doing 100% of social service here. So we need to be aware of how can we work better with these uh, populations. We recruiters will be working with individuals that might share the same background, ethnicity, but will have different, they will have different cultures and traditions. We must learn how to engage with these populations. We need to have an ethical and professional behavior. Again, we need to separate our biases, forget about your beliefs or about what you think. It doesn't matter. Focus on the families, they're the priority here. Um, have a uh, recruiters will learn how to engage with individuals or minority experiment, minority groups, experimenting oppression, economical problems, legal subtle problems, or having other similar disadvantages because that's what they are, disadvantages, you know? When we're familiar with those concepts, we're gonna be able to provide good services, Justin, because you cannot provide Medicaid uh, services, well, in most of the cases, to a person that doesn't have documents, right? So you need to be familiar with the needs in order for you to be familiar with the services and to be efficient. We need to, to be familiar with the needs of the families as well to learn, uh, to evaluate or our services and to see if our services are being meeting the basic needs of these families. It doesn't matter if it, our program is a supplemental program, just focus on that for a little bit, reflect and, and it'll make sense. Uh, please, please uh, recruiters, people uh, from today, really work on trying to understand diversity and get familiar with the concept of uh, different concepts that affects our migrant community. Discrimination, oppression, economical instability, um, disadvantages, racism, being all these things our families are experiencing every day. Uh, it is essential to evaluate our interventions, uh, Justin. I uh, think that through evaluation we can learn if our services are being effective and meeting the basic needs of families. Uh, in my opinion, systems, and not just in my opinion, um, based on some studies, 
systems that do not evaluate their services or intervention uh, often tend to invest on services that are not effective. And this would badly interfere with our principal goal, which is in the case of the MEP program, we want to recruit students and help them graduate from high school and be successful in their education. Now, before finishing, interdisciplinary collaboration. What is this? We need to create a good network with other agencies, which goal is very similar to ours. Now, if we can't help with rent, if we can't help with money, if we can't help with housing, well, find places that are willing to help these farm workers. We're a team. So interdisciplinary uh, collaboration is very essential and important because we can be providing uh, school supplies, um, uh, backpacks, tutoring classes, and other agencies can be supporting that same family with a house, finding a job, and different uh, kinds of things. Collaborate, recruiters. Uh, this is how I finish my presentation. Please learn to collaborate with other co-workers, with other recruiters. Please uh, try to work with your supervisors, with your mentors and members from the MEP program. It is through collaboration. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again. It is through collaboration that we can set up goals, evaluate our services, learn from each other and develop strategies that will better our program and will benefit our families. And that's our objective, right? So learn to collaborate. I want to thank you everyone for this opportunity. It was great talking to you. Thank you for bear with me with my accent. I had the opportunity to get rid of it once, but um, I decided not to because that's the proof of my acculturation and I'm really proud of it. So nah, that was just a joke. Thank you guys, have a great day. Thank you, thank you so much, Grandma. We have two last questions if you don't mind real okay. quick. Number one, do you have a favorite quote or saying that you use to motivate, you know, farm workers that you meet out there? Yes. Yes, I, I wrote this uh, once uh, and it's in Spanish. I can translate it in English ahorita. It says, todos los trabajadores del campo somos sembradores. Y nuestro mejor fruto son nuestros hijos. Sembramos en ellos la semilla de la educación. So all farm workers are harvesters or sembradores, that's how you say harvesters? Planters? Yeah, planters. And our most precious lands are our kids. Let's plant in them the seed of education and see them grow. That's a really powerful quote. And then the other last question we had is, what recommendation or advice do you have on what kind of clothes people should use while going out in the field and visiting farms and um, farm workers? Now that you're wanting to try to leave, you know, a professional impression on the farm owners, especially while also still being modest and not looking too fancy, like you mentioned with the farm workers. Can, can you repeat the question, uh, Justin? Yeah, what advice do you have on um, what type of clothes people should wear while out visiting the fields in order to still be professional while also not coming across as looking too fancy? Yeah, I like wearing boots, just, uh, you know, simple shoes. You can wear tennis shoes, uh, just jeans, uh, shirt, not too, too, too nice and not too bad, you know, just be like normal regular like as you will go to to a store and that does what i do um try not to be so elegantly for the situation and try not to be like dressed like very bad as well so i like to yeah wear boots or tennis shoes and jeans don't wear shorts in the fields guys there's a lot of snakes um and don't don't wear heels, girls, because it's gonna be very hard for you to walk through the, the rows of dirt. Um, that's my advice. Awesome. Yeah, polos. Yes, polos, of course. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. I think we all learned a lot of information. Um, thank you everybody for attending. We had about 215 people here today. So that was, we had a lot of people joining us. So we really appreciate everybody joining us for this presentation and for the conference. Um, here is my email address in case anybody has any other questions. Um, and I will be sure to share Gama's email address later. This presentation, the recording, and the slideshow will be available to download for everybody so that you can reference it in the future. You can come back to it. But again, we thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Agama. One big round of applause um, for joining us and for sharing. And we hope everybody has a great day. I will say, as we're, we're